Okay, programmable DNA. How do we use it? What types of applications can be built on top of it? What can you do with programmable DNA? And what implications does it have for many, many different problems that exist in society? We are going to react to an interview of CEO and co-founder of Ginkgo Bioworks, a organism cell programming programmable DNA company. And we're going to listen to him speak and analyze the use cases of programmable DNA and genomic sequencing in the context of different parts of the world and different problems in the world that need to be solved. This was a really interesting one, so let's get right into it, and we'll talk more in the back end. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate we it. We know that you guys are concentrating on solving some vitally important, you know, problems like replacing petroleum, you know, based chemicals, uh, animal sourced food products, um, agriculture without harmful fertilizers. Uh, what other areas is a uh, ginkgo disrupting? Uh, are there any like quick and easy wins that you think of, and you know? What challenges do you have to overcome to tackle bigger problems? Yes. Yeah, so, so the first thing I would say is like, if you said a company was going after all those things, someone would rightfully say, that's freaking crazy. It's yeah, too broad. You're, why did you focus, right? And so the reason that Ginkgo can actually be in all that stuff is it's our customers that are doing that. Yep. Right? You know, Bayer Crops, like a $100 million joint venture with Bayer. You know, they, are, they want a microbe that's engineered to produce fertilizer for crops, right? So what he's saying there already is that Ginkgo Bioworks is a platform and they take a horizontally platform approach to genetic sequencing and programmable DNA. All these problems that the interviewer mentioned is not something one company can solve, just like all the way you organize the world's information is not one thing Google or Apple can solve, but it's all these little applications that are built on top of their frameworks that can offer you an application for photos, an application for videos, all these different things. So Bayer and Ginkgo Bioworks, a startup, aimed to make crops uh, produce their own nit nitrogen fertilizer. Bayer wanted a genomic, a, a programmable DNA to be able to actually be able to make nitrogen fertilizer in a more efficient and effective way. And they used Ginkgo Bioworks in order to be able to do that. It's all these different companies that are, that are using their platform to be able to solve all these issues. But the platform has to be good enough for those companies to use them in the first place. Right? Uh, uh, it's called Join Bios, our yes. joint venture. Yeah. And so it pulls nitrogen out of the air and fertilizes the crop so that you don't have to put synthetic nitrogen fertilizer on there. That's that's the spec of the program they want written, that cell program. And so you got, there are plants already that do this. Yeah. Like, I think it's peanuts. Yeah, it's exactly, legumes. Taking yeah. that yeah. genetic code and then replicating it for like wheat, corn, and rice. Is yeah, it? yeah, so I'll tell you the story because I like it because I was a chemical engineer uh, at MIT. So, 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 okay, so the way that is t today, by and large, is, is a, a process called Haberbosch. Just like the pride of chemical engineering, is invented by the Germans, and you basically you you pull atmospheric gas, which is like seventy percent nitrogen, through a big chemical plant. You burn natural gas, mm -hmm. right? And you take the nitrogen, you put it with the iron, and you get ammonia. And and so like, and it is like not small. It's like four percent of global greenhouse gas. Or so, is is just making synthetic fertilizer. Wow. It's a huge environmental impact, but. You get seventy billion dollars a year of bags of fertilizer that you ship off to farmers. They put it on fields, and like you know, yeah, half goes as a runoff, creating a local problem. Yeah. You get atmospheric problem. But we all got to eat, you know, right? <laughs> like, like otherwise, we, you know, this was the whole green revolution and part of what happened in the fifties. To because there's a lot of remember, people might remember there was a big concern that like we were going to overshoot our food supply. Yeah. Well, well, part of the way we solved that was Haberbosch. The other way was dwarf crops, was actually genetics, breeding the, the corn so it wouldn't fall over when it had more corn on it. But anyway, those two things together give us the food we have today. All right. Well, certain crops like legumes, like soybeans, fertilize themselves. Sure. How do they do it? Well, on their roots is are microbes running Haberbosch. They're literally pulling nitrogen out of the air and fertilizing the crop for free. Yep. And and so if you remember like crop rotation, like in elementary school, like that's what's going on. You plant the legume and it like leaves behind some fertilizer. Then you put in a different one, and so you can like re-fertilize the soil naturally, right? And so that that's the that process works great in legumes, but corn, wheat, and rice half a global fertilizer usage. They just didn't happen to evolve to have these microbes. So that's a 70 some. And so if you're talking about corn, wheat and rice, which is something the entire world uses, but they don't have the same type of uh, processes that happen in places like lagoons because of environmental reasons, that's where programmable DNA to be able to actually be able to build nitrogen fertilizer in a way that involves genomic sequencing, which is something that you need, right? A platform to be able to allow you to do when it comes to programming the DNA is is incredibly interesting and it's incredibly exciting and it offers the opportunity to actually do something that's happening naturally synthetically and that's why synthetic biology has also all these opportunities for companies to be able to build uh, on top of platforms that are actually programming the dna billion dollar industry that you guys are going to disrupt 
it, it, it is an industry today that is effectively a zero dollar biotech industry. Well, and you figure too, just the you're curbing pollution uh, drastically, right? Because there's runoff of all these chemicals in the existing model. Yeah, it goes into the rivers and the food that we're consuming. It's a it, it's a, an it's awesome a end yeah. application. Yes, and, and and what we would do is we would take the microbes that live on corn, and and you would read the DNA of the microbes that live in soy, mm -hmm. find the part of the code that says run Haberbosch, and move it over, right? So reading the microbes on one thing, reading the microbes on the other thing, dissecting the things you need to, to do, and then being able to do that programmable DNA, which then also has some type of environmental effects. I mean, this stuff is exciting at a different level, right? And this is something I haven't been as excited for when it comes to a company in a while, in, in a long time. And, you know, it's, it's just more and more interesting to learn about how this is happening. And yeah, now, you know, you have to then redesign it 100,000 times and all this stuff, you know, like there's a lot of work, but like, but that's the goal. And then if you do it, yeah, you're 100% right. Yeah, it, that, that taps into a market that today is a, a $0 biotech market, but could be a $70 billion biotech market. Are there right? any other like quick wins, you know, you guys know you could tackle? I wouldn't call that a quick win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, See, that's a quick win. We that, have to times that, that, this that, corn that, kernel for 10,000 yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a, that is a, that's a real project. The, the, uh, well, it's, it's yeah, for sure. you can wrap your mind around. Yeah, I'll give you another one I like. Yeah. So, so um, have you had an Impossible Burger? Mm. Not yet. I have. You have had one? I'm curious. Yeah. Okay, right. It was so, all right. Yeah. <laughs> so I, like, I, I like burgers, right? Like they, uh, they had a lot of burgers as a kid. Uh, and, and so, you know, you bite into the Impossible Burger. And it's a veggie burger, yep. but it bleeds. Beet juice. Yes. No. Actually. What? Yes, you said beet juice. Oh. So you bite into this and you're like, what is going on? And you would think beet juice, but beet juice doesn't taste nearly as good as what Impossible does, which is they have hemoglobin in there, which is the protein that makes blood red. You're like, how the hell are they getting hemoglobin in there? It's not a lot of <laughs> blood in plants. What are they doing? What Impossible did was they took brewer's yeast, like you would use to make beer. Uh -huh. They get the gene for hemoglobin, just like Genentech did back with insulin okay. in the 80s. Okay? Mm -hmm. And they put it into yeast, they brew it up, <laughs> and they make heme so with no cow. Out, instead of beer, you get, you get heme. And then you add that to a burger, and suddenly it smells right, tastes right, it's Impossible Whopper Burger King. That, that is a product that is like a disruptive hamburger product. It tastes so good because there is an animal protein in there with no animal. Well, that magic trick is accomplished with synthetic biology. You guys are right? Houdini. <laughs> uh, this, you have no idea. Like, like, like at, at this point, the stuff we, our ability to design biology today, like in the arc of what's gonna be possible is a joke, mm -hmm. yeah. right? It's, it's like computers in the 50s or something, right? Like we're just like banging around, and everyone, you know, like it, it, it is, there's so much room for improvement in our ability to design. We're just doing the absolute lowest hanging fruits today, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and so there, and there are some great ones. And so I, I, you know, we have a company on and so, so that's the part that I wanted to react to. This part, I think it's interesting to analyze, right? So there's two things you said. Number one, uh, we're in the very early innings of what we can do with genomic sequencing. Uh, because, as he said, it's like computers in the 50s. We have done nothing with it. Creating an impossible burger is not like the ultimate use case of genomic sequencing. There are a series of opportunities that exist in millions of different niches on the planet in terms of what you can do with programmable DNA and the platform that controls that is going to win. And there's going to be multiple platforms, but the main player is going to be the main players. Now, second is that hemoglobin example. If hemoglobin is the protein that creates red blood and it's this type of animal protein and it actually makes the burger feel as if it's real meat and, and to an extent tastes like it's real meat, but it's not real meat, that allows through synthetic biology and genetics and genomic sequencing, the ability to program DNA so that a burger that is not made of meat, which again, why don't you want to do that? A, because you want to make, you know, people more healthier. And in general, it's like more healthier to not eat meat. And there's a lot of studies around that. Um, and then B, uh, to save the environment, because we all know the Cowspiracy, a great documentary on Netflix that, you know, eating meat does hurt the environment. It does play a role in greenhouse gas emissions. So if you want to make an impossible burger, you just want to give people another option to be able to consume meat in a way that's not actually meat. You need the synthetic biological uh, ability to use hemoglobin in a way that makes it seem like it's meat when it's not. And that application is a very tiny application, as Jason Kelly, the CEO of DNA, was saying in the broader scheme of things. And this is when, when he talks about it, I get very excited listening to him. And, and you know, he could be wrong, but you want to look at where the macro level trends are going and you want to look at companies that are disruptive, right? When you're really looking for massive opportunities, it's like, okay, if, if, if companies see this potential vision, this $0 market that exists that could one day become a $70 billion market only in this one niche, and they're operating in a lot of different niches because they control the platform that controls the basis to access those niches, then there's a chance. 
And uh, it's just a question of believing that chance, believing in the science behind that chance, and then believing in the platform's approach to be able to have a business way, right? So shareholder value can appreciate in order for that um, company to, to perform well. But it's very interesting to see really, really untapped market opportunities for Ginkgo Bioworks and for other synthetic biology companies that are going after it. Let me know what you guys thought. Thank you for listening and watching. Do you see a big opportunity? Have you eaten an Impossible Burger before? And uh, do you kind of see or do you believe that the $0 market that currently exists in this niche could one day be a bigger market? Thank you so much for listening and watching. I'll see you in the next one.